Abby McBride is a self-described sketch biologist who writes and illustrates stories about science and nature. She has a, a science and biology degree from Williams College, um, a science writing degree from MIT, and a tendency to wander around outside with a sketchbook. This may sound familiar. Um, after college, uh, Abby took the obvious career path and did some farming in Spain, um, became an illustrator in New York City, manned the helm of a Maine lobster boat, um, bird blogged across the Western United States, studied boobies on an uncharted, uh, uh, uninhabited Galapagos Island, um, coached swimming, taught piano lessons, assisted an invasion ecology textbook revision, um, worked as a pastry chef in roughly that order. Um, after grad school, uh, she wrote for the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, sketched icebergs in Iceland and giraffes in Kenya and babblers in Borneo, and developed a communications program for the American Ornithological Society, and somehow ended up riding a three-speed bicycle uh, from Italy to Budapest. <laughs> Tonight, Abby will share her story of spending a year in New Zealand sketching seabirds, writing stories about seabird conservation for National Geographic and Fulbright. Abby, thank you so much for coming to Wild Wonder to teach and to share your passion and experience with our community. Please join me in welcoming Abby McBride. Hello, everyone. This morning, a bunch of us woke up in the dark and met around sunrise at Fisherman's Wharf, where we got on a boat with a legendary seabirding guide named Debbie Shearwater. This is a woman who changed her last name to a seabird and spent 44 years, the past 44 years, showing people the wildlife of the open ocean. She really wanted to be here tonight, but she's actually weeks away from retiring, and she has another trip dark and early tomorrow morning, so she couldn't make it. But we had a very exciting day. We saw seabirds and pinnipeds and cetaceans of all sorts. We did some sketching. We enjoyed the effects of motion sickness. <laughs> Tonight I'll be telling you about a very different time and place, but by the end I think it will become clear how it's really all part of the same story. I was in a forest with my sketchbook in the dark, standing next to my little tent, which is about the same size and shape as a coffin. It was just after sunset on one of the Poor Knights Islands, 30 miles off the coast of northern New Zealand. I was listening to branches scraping in the wind and the muffled roar of the ocean. This is an island rimmed with spectacular cliffs and beds of jagged volcanic rock. It's surrounded by a marine reserve that was on Jacques Cousteau's top 10 list, number seven. But the most mysterious secret of this island is actually hidden inside the forest, and I was about to find out what it was. Suddenly, there was a crash in the branches over my head, and a second later, a thump on the ground, then some rustling sounds. It happened again. Crash. <laughs> thump. Rustle, rustle, rustle. Soon there were crashes and thumps and rustlings coming from all directions. So I turned on the red light of my headlamp, which in New Zealand is called a head torch, Turn that on, and this is what I saw. Scattered over the ground were these creatures, about the size of a small duck. But these were no ducks. They were Buller's shearwaters, which nest in the poor Knights Islands of New Zealand and nowhere else in the world. If anything looks out of place on the forest floor, it's a seabird. But there they were, dozens of seabirds all around me, arriving like meteorites, scurrying around and disappearing into holes in the ground. In fact, there were burrows tucked away all around my tent. I couldn't see this, but I knew that deep inside each of those burrows was a fluffy shearwater chick, quietly waiting for its parent to come and feed it a delicious meal of regurgitated squid. I also knew that I had a short window of time while the parents were underground with their chicks before they would come back out and socialize with each other loudly for the night. So I took advantage of that. I unzipped my coffin tent and I lay down to sleep.
quite a presence. But it's really hard to get a good look at them. And that's kind of the issue with seabirds. Ironically, they're not always that easy to see. We're talking about roughly 360 bird species worldwide that make their living from the ocean, ranging from penguins to albatrosses, along with gulls and terns, gannets and boobies, cormorants, which in New Zealand are called shags, petrels, storm petrels, and lots of others, including a few dozen species of shearwater. A lot of these birds spend their lives out of sight on the open ocean, coming back to land only to breed, often only under cover of darkness, often disappearing into underground nests, which makes them essentially invisible to humanity. That's where my work comes in. I'm a sketch biologist, which is sort of a modern version of a Victorian naturalist. It's also a title I made up. <laughs> Sketching is the way that I study wildlife around the world, and it's also the way that I share that with other people through illustrated stories. And I'm interested in all sorts of different organisms and landscapes, but I have a particular fondness for birds and for the ocean. And sometimes I get to study both of them at the same time. I've worked with Project Puffin on the coast of Maine, where I'm based. I've done seabird research in the Galapagos, studying Nazca boobies on an uninhabited island. And the more I study seabirds, the more I want to keep studying them. One reason for that is the intriguing double life they lead on land and sea, which I think is, is unique among animals, but it's pretty relatable for humans, especially those of us who like to spend time on the ocean. And I also have a strange attraction to the smell of guano, which is a little bit less relatable, I think. <laughs> But if you've never been to a seabird colony and inhaled deeply, you just don't know what you're missing. <laughs> and then there's the, the most obvious reason to study seabirds, which is the extremely fluffy chicks. They're just really, really fluffy. Really fluffy. <laughs> Unfortunately, seabirds are the fastest declining group of birds on the planet. In 60 years, we've lost 70% of their global population. That's bad, especially because seabirds are so important. That link between land and sea that I mentioned is not some kind of empty metaphor. It's actually an indispensable role they're playing ecologically. These birds are eating fish and krill way offshore, and then they're depositing that glorious guano on their breeding grounds. So they're responsible for nutrient cycling between marine and terrestrial ecosystems. They also connect ecosystems around the world by making huge migrations that crisscross entire oceans. Plus, they're apex predators with very long lives and slow reproduction very sensitive to changes in the environment, which makes them the coal mine canaries of the sea. Their decline is nothing less than a global alarm bell. And that's the biggest reason that I proposed a seabird sketching project a few years ago when I applied for a Fulbright National Geographic Storytelling Fellowship. So where is the single best place in the world to sketch seabirds? Monterey is pretty good. But a full third of the world's seabird species can be found cruising around the waters of New Zealand. And most of those can actually be found nesting on land there as well. In fact, a tenth of the world's seabird species nest only in New Zealand. That's 36 endemic species, if you were counting. And the second place country is Mexico, which has only five endemic seabird species. So you can see why New Zealand is considered the seabird capital of the world and why I chose it for my project. It was about this time of year, almost exactly early September, um, the beginning of spring in the Southern Hemisphere, when I showed up in Auckland, hunted around until I found a 1998 Toyota station wagon for sale, and then proceeded to drive around the whole country twice. So for nine months, I was living out of my car and my tent. I was exploring with my inflatable kayak, and I was hitching rides on boats to remote islands in search of seabirds. Before I tell you much more about that, there is something important I should note. The New Zealand I saw is a different world from the New Zealand of just a few centuries ago. Prior to that, these islands had been isolated for 80 million years with no humans or any other land mammals. So when people finally started to arrive, bringing with them rats and cats and livestock and hunting, the native wildlife was devastated. And not just the flightless land birds like the kiwi and the kakapo that you've probably heard about, but also tremendous numbers of nesting seabirds that nobody ever hears about. Since then, those problems have multiplied. On land, there's still the invasive predator problem, compounded by habitat destruction and over-tourism. 
At sea, there's fishing bycatch, plastic pollution, light pollution, warming waters, and the cascading effects of overfishing. These are problems worldwide, but particularly urgent in New Zealand, where there are so many species on the verge of extinction. This all sounds pretty dire, but there is a silver lining. Traveling around New Zealand, I came across people in all corners of the country doing remarkable things to save the seabirds in their backyards, sometimes literally in their backyards, often with little to no funding, just a lot of Kiwi ingenuity. So <laughs> I'm going to show you a few of the adventures that I took part in while I was there. I followed a seabird detection dog named Rua up and down steep coastal slopes, sniffing out penguin and petrel nests. They could be better protected against predators, including other dogs from the nearby beaches. <laughs> I boated into a, a feeding frenzy to investigate how overfishing might be affecting seabirds indirectly through its impacts on krill and other disruptions to the food web. I rappelled down a 230-foot sea cliff with a retired scientist who does this regularly to check up on a very well-hidden colony of fairy prions. He found this colony decades ago, halfway down the cliff where rats can't reach. I sailed 300 miles south through turbulent seas to a sub-Antarctic island to help count endangered yellow-eyed penguins in their final stronghold. I joined up with a team of either conservation scientists or ghostbusters, I'm not sure which, to <laughs> capture New Zealand storm petrels. This is a bird that was thought to be extinct for the entire 20th century. Uh, they found it nesting on this island in 2013 and have since been helping it bounce back. I went out on a longline fishing vessel with some fishermen who were using special gear like streamers and weighted lines to help reduce the number of birds killed on their hooks. They were also targeting a diverse catch to avoid overfishing any one species. I met up with Maori conservation leaders at the southern tip of the South Island and helped monitor a population of sooty shearwaters, which are also known as mutton birds and are traditionally harvested by their communities. Stuck my arm down a lot of burrows. I was generally hoping to be bitten by one of those fluffy chicks so that I could pull it out and weigh it and measure it. There was always a chance of being bitten by a tuatara instead. And I went to the very remote home of one of the world's most endangered seabirds, the Chatham Island Tycho, 500 miles east of New Zealand. And there I met up with photographer Tom Peshak and writer Jonathan Franzen, who were working on the National Geographic story about the global seabird crisis. And I was able to use art to show aspects of the bird's life that couldn't be captured with a camera. So here's a, a little graphic story that came out of that, a, a window into the hidden life of the Chatham Island Tycho. So it was a thrilling year. It was also a long year. My closest companion was my car named Indy. We had some good times together. <laughs> I ate very healthfully, as you can see. Um, and became addicted to New Zealand cheese balls. <laughs> I spent many days in a state of queasiness, which will be familiar to some of you from today. Showers were infrequent, changes of clothes also infrequent. I was chased by the world's most endangered sea lion and pooped on by the world's most endangered gull. But to leave you on a slightly more dignified note, I'd like to take you back for a minute to the shadowy forest of the Poor Knights Islands in northern New Zealand. After this all but sleepless night, I got up out of my coffin tent a couple hours before dawn so that we could start catching shearwaters. If you've ever tried to catch a chicken, it's kind of like that. <laughs> Except these birds are what New Zealanders describe as being stroppy. It's a versatile term, but in this case it means they're going to bite you and it's going to hurt. <laughs> we, but we caught them anyway because we needed to band them and check for existing bands on their legs. It's the sort of basic research that's necessary for conservation but is sorely lacking in these elusive birds. So we were excited to find quite a few banded birds. And then we were really excited because at almost the last possible minute, we caught a shearwater that had been tagged with a geolocator five years before, um, which means that we'll get some 
insight into what that bird has been up to for the past five years. We caught that bird just as it was starting to get light out. And right then, there was a shift across the whole island. The shearwaters all started climbing up onto boulders and stumps and launching themselves back through the canopy and into the sky. While this was going on, I walked down to the edge of the forest and stepped out into the open to look out at the coastline. Silhouetted against the early morning sky, there were shearwaters streaming by over my head and from every corner of the island, heading back out to sea. Right now, those same birds that nest only on a small clump of islands in New Zealand are skimming over the ocean off the coast of California. And today, on that boat with Debbie Shearwater, we saw one of them. These seabirds truly connect the world, and they really need to be noticed. And I think that sketching can help bring their stories to light. Thank you.